so yeah, uh, Pythonic JavaScript for web developers, uh, or how to get modern JavaScript into your already existing Python projects would be the uh, almost more aptly, aptly name. So, uh, good hello, my name is Ville, aka Uninen, and uh, like Python, I like DJing, and both are my passions in life. And the past year, I have been uh, working with JavaScript, but I've been working on web since 1995, and with Django over 11 years, so I already feel a bit old here, but um, I code for fun um, and sometimes for, for, for work, but I don't really consider myself as a programmer per se. I work with mostly with small teams and uh, as a project manager and tech lead. And like I said, last year I worked, um, spent with a small Finnish startup um, bootstrapping a five person team development team uh, with agile uh, methods and writing JavaScript. And this was my first contact with uh, real JavaScript, if you will, and I learned a lot, and I think I learned stuff that um, maybe some other persons would like to know also, and that's why I wanted to give this talk to you. So let's start with you. Um, how many of you have heard at least one of these terms? Okay, so almost all of you. How many of you actually know what they mean? Okay, a little bit less. Uh, so the, the idea of this talk is to give like a really basic, basic introduction to modern JavaScript and, and uh, related things. The goal of this talk uh, is to get you an idea what's going on with modern JavaScript and to get you enough knowledge to get started with writing good stuff and also to uh, learn where to uh, learn more. So according to Wikipedia, 95% uh, of the top 10 million most popular web pages use JavaScript. Uh, that means that you actually need to know it even if you work in the back end. And, um, Unfortunately, uh, we are at the Europython, we are Pythonists, so why or why does uh, JavaScript need to look and feel a little bit like this, i.e. not very friendly or beautiful. So uh, to get a little bit perspective, let's take a look at the history. I think I skip, skipped a few. So. Um, JavaScript was developed basically in 10 days uh, in 1995 when the web looked like this. And to compare, Python was at the moment in version 1.2 and Netscape Navigator was just uh, released 2.0. And fast forward a few years in 1999, web looked like this and our JavaScript was um, forwarded to uh, version 4, which was um, uh, on par with Python 1.5. And uh, based on the news article I found there, everything else uh, were worse except the presidential problems. But anyways, um, we've been using basically the same JavaScript since then, uh, even now when our web looks totally different. And uh, this is why the definitive book of JavaScript is really um, huge and the good parts of the JavaScript is not so huge. Uh, this, by the way, is a good book and worth read if you want to learn uh, the good parts of JavaScript. Uh, it talks about functions and loose typing and dynamic objects and stuff like that. But there's more. So uh, recently, there was yet another version of uh, JavaScript called ES6 or um, ES2015. ES stands for ECMAScript, which is the standard for JavaScript. And um, these new features 
are basically moving the language in really, really good direction from the programmer's point of view. We are getting uh, let and const variables, which mean that you can actually now have uh, not global variables and you can have constants. Uh, you have real classes, object literals, better object literals. You have modules, iterators, generators, map and set and promises. Uh, template strings, destructuring, and ASIC await, um, and await. So it pretty much already starts to look more like Python and more like, like a proper programming language. And if we then um, go back to the way that we have used, to, at least I've used to develop JavaScript, which I call here the old school way, um, it's basically just adding jQuery to the site and then some script tags, and that's about it. And this is the whole whole life that I've been working on the web. This is, has mostly been the state of JavaScript on the on the web and on the projects I've I've been working. And um, fortunately, we now do have a better way, as Raymond Hedinger would want to shout at this point. Um, so the modern version is way more complex for obvious reasons. We now live in 2017, and our web apps and web pages are um, constructed in more um, complex ways, and the JavaScript part adds to it itself. We start with uh, NPM, which is a package manager for JavaScript. And um, it's the world's largest software registry, which is open source, but the registry holder itself is a um, incorporation. So that's a kind of interesting uh, thing right there. Anyways, um, NPM gives you a file called package.json, which is basically um, requirements txt for your pip um, in Python. And NPM has dependency tracking and stuff like that, so you can actually know what versions you are shipping with your product. Then we move to transpilers. Babel is the one um, usually used. Um, this transpiles your new code um, when you move things to production to old code that um, most browsers can understand, back to the ES5 or ES, even ES4. And um, we need to use that because, you know, browsers and IEE and stuff like that. But Babel is with our uh, JavaScript stack. Um, then linters, if you want to get like really busy with JavaScript and be good at it, you need to lint your code. Um, and in my opinion, it makes your coding experience, but also reading the code and, and doing code review and stuff like that way more pleasurable, as you know that um, you can maintain standards. ESLint is a um, JavaScript linting uh, package, which is, in my opinion, way better than Flake 8, for example. Uh, there are, at the moment, no official guidelines like PEP8, but there is a, a project called JavaScript Standard Style, which is a NPM module you can install, and it has uh, standard uh, recommendations also. And for the moment, I think the most used um, standard style or more, more, most used coding guidelines are Airbnb coding guidelines. By the way, I have links to everything I'm mentioning here, and I'll give you the link at the end of the talk. Then we have lots of different JavaScript modules and packages, and we need to ship them out. So uh, Webpack is, at the moment, uh, one of the most prominent tools for that. Webpack also does lots more. We've already had a talk here at EuroPython about Webpack. Um, it's a really powerful tool, but it's also quite complex and still not 
very stable, at least in my opinion, in, in like documentation terms and stuff like that. So um, when you bundle your, your um, assets, you need to invest a little bit time to get this one going on. Also, um, at this point, you probably want to um, collect and bundle all your all uh, other static data assets like um, CSS and SAS and stuff you want to pre-process, and Webpack can do that for you too. Um, also, Webpack includes some kind of pretty amazing stuff like um, tree shaking, which um, automatically can eliminate some dead code from your JavaScript and not include it in the production bundle if you just configure it right. And then um, after all these like build tools, you of course want to use some framework. This is the same kind of deal that usually when you start a Python project, you probably don't want to start from, from scratch. You uh, select your favorite uh, framework and start working. So the top three contenders in my book are Angular, uh, React, and Vue. And uh, if in your company one of these are already in, in use, you should just use that. Or if you know one already, just use that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But um, in case that you are not familiar with any framework so far, I would warmly recommend Vue, which is a, um, I'm, I'm, I've been working with Vue a lot, and uh, I've also been working with Django a lot. And I think Vue is a little bit like a child of Django and Flask, only it changed its gender to JavaScript. So. Um, it's really easy to get started. It has good documentation, which is uh, unheard of in JavaScript world. Um, it's lean and fast, but still robust enough to get you going with the really big project if you, if you need to. And it has Vuex, uh, which is kind of a React um, Redux kind of a data model too, if you need one. So. Um, these new shiny things require new tools and they require new configuration, which is obviously um, kind of a pain in the butt. And whenever I usually have needed to delve into JavaScript um, configuration, I end up to the wrong page in Google and it makes me shame of myself and the world. So to help with that, I have created an example project that uses Django and uh, this tag I mentioned. And I just pushed it on the GitLab project, but it's not quite there yet. But uh, we might have time to look at the code really quickly. Um, the idea here is that you can get an idea what you need to get started with uh, this kind of stack if you don't know what, uh, what's going on. Um, examples from the JavaScript world with uh, using the kind of frameworks like Django are really, really rare or they are non-existent and definitely no documentation exists anywhere. So I think this will help you, um, help you to start, uh, start away if you want to. So uh, what about the actual topic of the, of the talk? What is Pythonic JavaScript? Um, this is, by the way, a real sign from uh, Norway. I've, I was very pleased when I saw that. Um, in, uh, obviously, this is a quite opinionated list. This is my opinion, and your mileage may vary, but for me, Pythonic code is um, something you feel rather than measure. I think this comes down to the talk we had about beautiful code, and I think Pythonic is a little bit uh, same. But um, from JavaScript perspective, I think um, bundling your code into packages and into modules is the first thing you need to do. 
Um, namespaces are a honking great idea and stuff like that. So just use NPM. How many of you have worked with code like this in HTML? When you have loads of script tags importing something and then in the HTML itself, a script tag which has the actual code. I have, yeah, so most of us. Um, the better way of doing is, it is to uh, put everything in one, one file with uh, ES6 plus syntax um, and start with using strict mode. It prevents you from uh, writing bad code and disables some uh, bad features of the language. And then you start importing the libraries. Um, this first import is a require function, which is a Node.js uh, function. This is a not native JavaScript. Um, some of the older libraries and some, well, some libraries still need this require and won't work well with the native imports, but um, some do, and then I add it just to uh, point out that it still might be hairy that sometimes you need to like explicitly set something to window because some libraries just don't work, but the, this is what it is. And then you have like the native uh, module imports. Native imports in JavaScript look quite familiar for Pythonists, and this is actually, I. I really enjoy when I see this kind of JavaScript code. And the last one, we put everything, uh, our code itself in um, ify, which is immediately invoked function expression, uh, aka AAFE. So um, everything put in to uh, here won't uh, leak outside, and now that I after I wrote this, I figured out that when we are actually writing new JavaScript, it doesn't matter so much, but this is, this is the way the old schoolers like to do it. And then at the, at the end, it gets, the program gets uh, run, so all you need to do on your HTML is um, add the one minified and uglified and stuff um, JavaScript file that was uh, bundled with um, Webpack. So that's the first thing. You have, you bundle your files and instead of doing multiple imports and, and stuff like that, you collect NPM packages and you handle them in one place. And that's kind of, a, um, kind of a way of working that we have been used to in like uh, proper programming languages and now we can do it in JavaScript too, so that's kind of nice. Coding guidelines uh, and the linting stuff is really important in my opinion. Uh, JavaScript um, obviously um, doesn't work like Python, which um, in Python you can read other people's code quite easily. In JavaScript you can't, unless you have really good guidelines on how to write your code. So if you write, for example, for your company and you have several developers in your team, it really helps a lot if everybody, everybody um, writes consistent code and after you check the code in to the uh, repository and it's been peer reviewed, no, no one should be able to tell who wrote the code. Um, and when you lint, lint the code, it's quite easy to do and um, strict code review, of course, helps. It's amazing how how much better looking and better feel you get to a JavaScript file without doing it anything else but just like arranging it differently via the coding guidelines. It's, it's amazing. And then the um, maybe obvious, maybe not thing, but the semicolons uh, are optional in JavaScript. So in my opinion, why use them? Um, we are transpiling our code, so the transpiler adds them where it needs to automatically. Uh, even if we do use them or don't use them, it's, the transpiler doesn't care, so why should we? Um, 
So, um, like those lisp parentheses, these might be elegant weapons, uh, like your father's parentheses, but we don't need them, so let's not use them. So, to recap, Pythonic JavaScript, in my opinion, is modular. It consists of packages, just like your Python projects. It has a package JSON. You can import stuff there. You can keep separate projects in separate repos if you want to. Uh, it's testable and it's tested. You can actually test the code when you write it this way, and it's easy to test. And this is this is a big, big thing. Even if you have that one small JavaScript file in your in your project, if you write it this way, you can actually test it, and then you you know that when you change your Django model or whatever, um, when you run your front-end JavaScript tests, if they um, don't break, you are losing less sleep when you are pushing things to production. And when you lint the code, it actually looks good and it looks um, similar to everybody else's code. And um, extra bonus, it's semicolon free. So um, I'm not really sure how much time we have left. Um, 20 minutes. Um, we can do, at this point, I think, a short demo of the, short demo of the, of the code I pushed. Mm, if I find my cursor from somewhere. Mm. Is it in, nope. No. Here we go. Oops. Yes, now we are sharing the same screen. So um, let's do this. Uh, can you see this? All right. Um, let's start with the project. So um, uh, this is the demo project. Um, it's not quite finished yet, but it's just a basic Django skeleton with one app, and uh, it has some static files. It has a SAS file and a JavaScript file. The SAS file, how many of you know SAS? Okay, almost all. So SAS is a um, CSS kind of um, thingy that you can pre-process to uh, um, CSS. We use this to render the uh, CSS for the demo page, which look like looks like this. It's just a really, really simple um, HTML page. And the whole JavaScript here is here. So if we go from top to bottom, um, we are in strict mode, and this hot module thing is a webpack helper that is actually quite awesome thing. Uh, when you develop with webpack serv uh, development server and you change your JavaScript code, the code gets updated in the browser automatically, and it doesn't mean the Django run server kind of refresh the whole page. It just refreshes the JavaScript, and it's, um, it keeps the state. So imagine like developing huge JavaScript one page app that has loads of state, and you just uh, change one thing, one little thing, you don't need to refresh the page, everything uh, stays the same, and Webpack just reloads it for you. Uh, then we are using Vue uh, and jQuery, and we are using the cookies module because we want to um, use this Ajax uh, post method from uh, jQuery with Django's CSR token. Um, in the requires, this is pretty weird thing uh, about Webpack that I personally don't 
quite understand nor like, but if you can require anything that Web, Webpack can read, um, if you have a plugin for SAS, you can require SAS, and Webpack just it just um, eats it for you. And uh, so, if you want to do CSS with or SAS with uh, Webpack, you need to require the files. Um, and then the actual code is really simple view instance. So you attach the view instance to any uh, HTML element, and uh, this one has data elements, so uh, it's just um, like um, object variables here. This is totally not like finished or even thought out yet, but um, I put something to uh, get started. Uh, computive um, methods are, uh, think of them as um, Python properties, so they, uh, this total sum acts like a property that automatically updates when your um, um, variable updates. And then you have methods that are methods. We also have in view these uh, special uh, methods like created, which, uh, as you might uh, guess, gets run when the, when the instance is created. At the moment, um, this doesn't do quite nothing yet. It's get, it gets um, hooked into this main container, and then I think we have he, 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 here, uh, here, we have this v dash model, which is, where's my heart to see this one? Here. Um, when we change V model in the um, form itself, it automatically updates in, in the view um, view instance, and this would be really um, better if I could show you the actual page, but I, I think I'm not going to get it running at this point um, before we run out of time. But um, the idea here is that uh, to get view going, you only need this really, really small instance of clean and easy to read and understand JavaScript. And um, other point here I wanted to uh, uh, explicitly made is that you can use it with your existing jQuery thingies. You can have your page full of jQuery thingies, but you can um, just add the view, view, view thing right next to it and it just works or you can start with a clean slate like we did here and just do it. There's one more um, special thing here. Uh, this is something I wrote for myself as a helper for the webpack and production pushes because we might next want to see the webpack config. So here we have webpack config which is a JavaScript module that actually just requires another module based on the env variable we give it from the command line. And if we have dev env, we require some webpack things first and some plugins, and then we get git hash. Uh, i explain it in a minute. And then uh, webpack wants uh, entries that it, it reads, and I've um, imported them from here. So you might have, we only have here just one JavaScript file, but for example, in a typical Django project, you'd, you'd have one or two JavaScript files for every Django app you have, for example. And you can grow this list as large as you want, and Webpack just, um, with this notation, you, you get uh, each uh, one file for each entry. And you can uh, um, bundle those entries too, and it, really, it gets really complicated. This is really, really simple stuff here. And for um, caching and for 
ease of um, production pushes, we use uh, git hash in the bundle name. So automatically, when you um, push your code um, and then build the static assets with Webpack, the assets get named with the git hash. And then there are some dev server things and uh, um, rules how to, uh, how to uh, use JavaScript, what to do with JavaScript files, uh, uh, use them with Babel. And uh, then there are uh, tests for view files, which we didn't get to see yet. And then there are SAS files and the list of plugins. And if I show you really quickly the template tag I wrote, the idea here is that um, in the template tag, we do the same thing. We get the git hash, and then the template tag outputs the script name for us. So in development, we, uh, we can use this demo file, and in, uh, or in development, we can have it on a local server and in production wherever we want. And this is just, it just works automatically. So this is something you'll find from the, from the, um, Git repo I, I um, uploaded. And now if we can quickly back into the presentation. Um, to recap, um, semicolons in JavaScript are totally unnecessary when you use transpilers. Note, when you don't use transpilers, um, it's not 100%, but it's 99% uh, sure. But if you use transpilers, if you build this tag, it's pointless to use semicolons. Um, there are tons of good tools and packages for JavaScript, so don't write stuff yourself. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, the NPM is full of good stuff, also, unfortunately, bad stuff. Um, there are easy-to-use fra frameworks, and there are hard-to-use frameworks, just like there are in Python. And um, turn on linting to every project. And it kind of is lipstick on a pig, but hey, that's JavaScript. But um, with good tools, you can actually have quite fun with JavaScript too. So yeah, um, when you do it like this, you can like automate everything. You can have it in your like production uh, QI builds just like every other language. So um, investing to this is, um, is a good thing, I think. Um, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for any questions? Yes, we have time for questions. So any questions? No questions. There must be some. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, only a little question. Uh, when to use uh, require and when to use import? Uh, That's a good question. Um, use require when the import doesn't work, basically. <laughs> JavaScript packages are really, really poorly documented, but if the package is good, it, um, it works with import. Uh, if the package is older, it probably doesn't work with import. But if it, um, uh, if it uses like write spec, it just works with import. But you need to, you need to look at the documentation and you, you need to, uh, basically almost every time you need to look at the source because there is no documentation. So uh, yeah, that's JavaScript for you. But that's a really good question. Um, when you build your own stuff and when you try to evaluate what packages you want to use, uh, select those that are like you can use with native imports and, and modules because they are obviously better written and maintained. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. So um, there are certain um, actual Python uh, 
Python, but then into web compiled. Yes. Uh, okay, have you ever considered that for, for actual production use or just for shits and giggles? Like PyPyJS and such, I mean. I, I got to eat it, lots of uh, those frameworks, and I, I didn't even know that they existed. There are, there are interesting um, uh, takes on the topic, and I think that if that's your thing, you want to write, like, for example, if you like TypeScript and that kind of stuff, um, then it, it might be for you, and why not use it in production if it works? So um, I myself haven't wanted to go down to that route because um, I think the, the tools that are built with JavaScript, when you have the stack working, it works really well, and you, all, the, all the tools and all the, all the um, IDEs and stuff like that and debug tools and stuff like that already work. So um, I don't quite need to uh, feel the need to keep in Python in, in that low level. But if it works for you, great. And uh, yeah, I would like to know if some like big pro project actually uses that kind of uh, transpiler. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again.